Thank you very much, and it's a real honour to be here today. Um, what you might not know is that I um, wasn't born in Perth, but I grew up here. Today I saw one of my old school friends <laughs> in the audience, which was really fabulous, um, and she works in the health department in communications. So that was um, really nice, and uh, so I feel very much at home and, and very, um, very much welcomed, and tomorrow I'm looking forward to a really great meal of Shark Bay crabs in my sister's garden. <laughs> um, I'm not going to sing, but I thought Ingrid singing was so beautiful, especially on such a sad day for her. Um, my mum recently passed away and I haven't been able to sing since. <laughs> so I thought that was a really beautiful um, way to start the day. Uh, it's not all going to be bad news, but it's not all good news. So today I'm going to talk about what should be done, what progress has been made, uh, potential government policy um, areas that they can intervene, current challenges, positive developments, why progress is so slow, and what should we be doing more of. Uh, so I'm going to whip through um, some slides and hopefully you'll be able to um, read them on the screen as well. So there's a number of key policy issues that we are facing and it's fantastic to see WA really shining a light on chronic disease because it's a large problem, as Barry's already talked about, and we need a focus on prevention as well as acute care. I've decided that uh, I should be away for every budget, state and federal. I went to the state health budget briefing in Victoria. There was a lot of talk about ambulances. There was a lot of talk about building bigger emergency services. There was also a lot of talk about building um, more recreation centres and putting money into sport. Um, all building bigger ambulances, more ambulances, more staff. There was nothing about prevention. It was all about putting the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, bigger ambulances, and nothing about putting the fence at the top. And you need to do both. And it was billions of dollars going into this bottomless pit. So very pleased to hear that there is a focus here on prevention. And what I've been doing for the last 12 years is developing and advocating the case for prevention with a few lawyers, in fact, because much of this rests with law and regulation and sits in the um, area of responsibility of our politicians. Um, and we do need a sense of urgency. I think what's happened to us is it's got hotter and hotter in that water uh, and we have, haven't really taken stock. When I talk about junk food marketing to children, people kind of glaze over because it's all about gambling advertising now. And I think we're forgetting what these serious problems are and that we need to act and it's still an urgent issue. Uh, and I was very pleased, I hadn't spoken to Barry, but talking about building the evidence base and using the evidence and finding better ways to talk about the evidence, I think is really critical. And they've got some fantastic material there. I really um, urge you to take a look. Two really great reports on obesity, one around um, cohort studies over time showing that for um, two to five year olds, overweight and obesity has doubled, showing that the best place to intervene is with adolescents, not children, a very difficult group to influence. But I'm going to give some ideas about how to do that. And I've been doing a lot of work around building consensus around the policy response because Nicola Roxon said to us, and it was very good advice, in obesity, you are all asking for something different and it's very easy for politicians to do nothing. So trying to create a sense, um, shared platforms um, is something that we've been doing a lot of work around. So what should be done? And many of you will be familiar with this, but I know not all of you come from an obesity control background. So I'm just going to give you a little primer. And I think this is a really great um, example. It's quite old, but um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The problem's still there. The gradient, the environmental gradient, is very steep for people. Uh, Nick Cormus, who um, does uh, bariatric surgery, said to me, my patients are on a white knuckle ride to eat healthily. It's very, very difficult. And anyone who's been in Perth Airport knows how hard it is to find even somewhere to fill up a water bottle. And unless we change the environment, we are, not, we are not going to succeed in supporting people to remain a healthy weight and for children not to put on weight over time. So that's really critical to make it easier for people to change their behaviour. Um, this is... Uh, I got a little... I got a... What can I do? 
can I do here? Oh, hang on, what have I done? Gone backwards. Oh dear. Oh, here we are. Now, how do I go? Oh, there we are. Right. So, oh, I'm going to point. I'm not tall enough. That's not usually an issue. <laughs> where's, my, where's my, where are my taller friends? So, up in the top corner, this is from The Lancet. So, they've gone modern. They don't just write great papers, they now do infographics. And I think this is a really good infographic about what is the role of government in all of this. And it's at the top. And they talk about restricting marketing to children, taxing unhealthy foods, legislating for consumer-friendly nutrition labelling, investing in infrastructure to produce healthier foods, subsidise healthy foods to increase availability and affordability, provide healthy eating education, set standards in schools, incentivize healthy food retailers to enter low-income areas, and I, you know, that would apply to um, providing healthy, cheap food in remote communities, provide healthy, uh, pr regulate to prevent positioning of unhealthy food outlets where children gather. So there's quite a range of um, areas of intervention for government, and the important thing with this is it's not just sitting in the health portfolio. You can see this sits in agriculture, this sits in transport, um, this sits in a range, of, um, a range of portfolios. So this isn't just an issue for uh, Roger Cook, the health minister, this is an issue for, for probably many of the um, cabinet members of cabinet and others in the ministry. And what's cost effective? Quite a lot. In fact, um, many, many things um, in obesity prevention are cost effective. Reducing exposure of children to unhealthy food marketing is very cost effective. The most cost effective is taxing sugary drinks. Um, replacing trans and saturated fat with unsaturated fat, limiting portion size and packages to reduce energy intake. We know, I was just talking before to Jonathan about this upsizing culture that we have. Um, implementing mass media campaigns, and you've got the very effective Live Lighter campaign, I would say gold standard, best in the world. You're very, very lucky to have that. That's really important. And nutrition education counselling. There's plenty of dietitians out there. They want to work harder. There's plenty of people that they can work with. And implementing nutrition labelling to reduce total energy intake and nutrients of concern. So they're the WHO Best Buys released last year. So fresh off the fresh off the print, printing press um, in order to support countries to meet, meet the sustainable development goals. So what progress is being made? Um, and last year, Deakin University, in fact, looked at benchmarking Australia to the rest of the world as far as best practice in food policy. So this was a, a really fantastic project, and I know many of you in the room participated in that project as informants. Uh, and they looked at the Australian government and all the states and territories. And I'll just start with um, the Australian government. So what they came out with where um, Australia was doing well was around monitoring. So I'm sorry Barry's gone because there's some good news for him. So we're very good at monitoring body weight at a national level and that's really important so we know where we're going. We don't have a GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. I was a little bit upset when the previous Premier came out, when I was here actually, and said there should be a GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. So I had a pretty busy time getting up at three o'clock in the morning doing media. <laughs> he kept me pretty busy. Um, I was up at 3.30 this morning doing media too about Milo. But anyway, um, I feel sorry for, for Mike Daub, who does a lot of media from Melbourne and Sydney in Perth. Um, the Health Star Rating Scheme, it works very well. Um, Simone's here who's done a lot of research on comparing that to other um, schemes. It's a very good scheme. There's some problems with it, but overall it works well and it's world's best practice. Food-based dietary guidelines, our guidelines are good. Um, and we have transparency and broad consultation for change, unlike some countries. So that's the good news. But you can see from these orange and red bars that it's not also good. And there's a lot of other areas where government can make change. And the top seven um, are around having a policy. We have a sports policy. We have a women's strategy from 2020 to 2030. Uh, we, we have many strategies. We're just developing a national alcohol strategy, which will be done soon. We don't have a diet strategy, obesity prevention strategy. And there's no one in Australia in any PHNs who's not above, the majority of people who are not above a healthy weight. So this is a pretty prevalent problem that's not being addressed in a long-term, coherent, sustained way. We don't have a national nutrition policy. Um, we should be considering a health levy on sugary drinks. 36 jurisdictions have either implemented or are implementing. 
Um, South Africa has just passed their legislation. In April, um, the controls in the UK come in, um, and that's a really important policy. Um, we need restrictions on exposure of children to unhealthy food marketing through TV, but other platforms. Uh, we need to um, change the health star rating system to address anomalies and also to make it mandatory. We're seeing it much more, appearing much more on healthier foods than unhealthy foods, even in the same product range like LCM bars. <clears throat> um, we need to have sustained funding and ongoing support for a nutrition and diet survey. We really need that. That's really important. And I don't think we can rely on um, industry supermarkets to provide that. We've asked them to provide that to evaluate the Health Star rating system. They were part of the group that organised it, helped develop it, and they haven't provided any information. And that's a problem. And we also need to um, um, establish targets for dietary intake around key nutrients of concern because we need a robust system for supporting changes to that and understanding what's happening. We've got the Healthy Food Partnership. It's worked okay for salt. It could work a lot, lot better. Um, and it's been fairly inactive for some time, although it has regrouped. So now to WA. Where is WA up to as far as what is in their remit and what they can do? So Western Australia, you have a top three. Um, you've got Healthway, and we, talked, uh, we heard about some of the work that's being done there from the um, Deputy Premier around um, supporting the uh, encouraging health messaging and discouraging unhealthy food and alcohol uh, sponsorships. And I, I've been involved with some of that work um, as a committee member, and, it's, and I think it is a really, really important, groundbreaking approach and I would really encourage the other, Vic Health in particular, um, to look at how that's been done because I think it's a very good model um, to try and support um, removal of those kinds of products re related back to sport. You have a high quality, very high quality campaign here with Live Lighter. There's very few campaigns that, that change not just attitudes but behaviour. And I'm about to go to Europe, the European Congress on Obesity, and talk about it, and I'm expecting to be swamped. I haven't ever seen a mass media evalu campaign evaluation even at those meetings, let alone one that is so successful. So it is absolutely groundbreaking, and I would expect, in the same way that the Every Cigarette's Doing You Damage campaign, it will be providing the blueprint for other countries in years to come. And the nutrition education for educators and inclusion of food and nutrition in the school curricula is good, amongst other things. But there are actions to meet best practice. Monitoring food environments, seeing what's happened, how are children being exposed in particular settings. Um, continuing to invest in these education campaigns, and I believe there is an ongoing commitment, and that's really critical going forward. We need leadership across government. As I said, this doesn't just sit in the health portfolio. We need policy coherence. We need a joined up approach. As we've heard already, and I'm going to repeat this, it's everybody's problem. And often governments can undermine each other from one department to another, and we've all seen that happen. It shouldn't happen, but it does, because there's not a joined up approach. Um, need to restrict and protect children, uh, particularly in settings controlled and managed by the Western Australian government, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And the provision of food to implement healthy food procurement and provision in areas where the government is buying and supplying that food. Um, we need to really um, emulate what we want the population to do, what we're telling them to do through Live Lighter. We should be making that very easy and making that a total priority for ourselves. So the potential government policy responses. So there is a lot of marketing of junk food to children. Children get on the bus, there's an ad for Hungry Jacks, Red Rooster, whatever, on the bus, um, or a Slurpee, they drive to school and they go past these advertisements on the bus or the train or whatever. Um, often the leisure centres are promoting junk food, even just through the branding of the Coke machine and things like that. Cinemas are another place where children see a lot of junk food marketing through children's um, movies. That's something the state government could act on. They could get rid of these junk food ads in kids' films. And often you get out of the film and the ch your child wants to get the toy that is promoted with the film. That's a real issue. Uh, schools um, are another setting that should be free of junk food. 
and um, ACT have done some work looking at exposure of children in supermarkets and um, places like that, big shopping centres, and there's a lot of junk food marketing in those places, and we've been seeing quite a lot of interactive, these bother boards where children are actually engaging with the product um, on these digital, digital boards. These are the kinds of things that I used to hate as a parent in the holidays when I took my kids to the movies, especially ones that said buy all six or however many there were when you saw the Simpsons movie. And then you'd go there to get whatever they wanted and they didn't have that toy. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And my children in the beginning never even ate the food. It was just about getting the toy. Um, another area which is where uh, Western Australia is behind the rest of the country is around kilojoule labelling. Um, we <laughs> Victoria is also running way behind um, and what we found was there were um, outlets that had this and there will be outlets here that have it but it's not put up in a standardised way and also the public don't really understand, it's such big numbers, um, they don't understand what, what it in fact means. So it's very important um, that we have standardised application of this, that it covers all outlets, including places like cinemas, which is probably the epitome of mindless eating and upsizing. Um, and in supermarkets, that it doesn't apply per 100 grams, but a, a price per product like a muffin, and that it does go into places like 7-Elevens, which have Krispy Kremes and things like that. And there are a lot of there's a lot of energy in Krispy Kremes. Um, and this is a fantastic campaign that New South Wales did around helping people to understand what 8,700 was. So that's what the average person eats every day, how much energy they eat. It's not exactly what they're ideally meant to eat, but that's what they do eat. So they did a campaign around helping people to interpret those numbers. So when they implemented the policy, they put this campaign together as well. So make the splash with the policy and then support the public to understand how to use it. And planning laws. Um, I've done a lot of work in uh, Victoria around planning um, to try and get health as an objective of the Planning Act. I can see you have exactly the same problem here. And we have a very, we have some very passionate communities. Um, it's all about burger off. You're much more polite in Western Australia. <laughs> They have a whole burger off campaign and in fact you know that McDonald's is feeling it because they, in, in, in um, Victoria they took seven people to court um, as part of that campaign. They dropped the case but they didn't want them to organise on Facebook. So um, you know, social media has really provided a platform for these communities to communicate and advocate and in, in uh, Victoria we have proposals to change the law, it just hasn't changed. But it's a shame when you have communities that do not want these outlets particularly 24-hour hour outlets, they don't have to prove they're not doing any harm. It's up to the community to prove that they are and they don't have the ability to do that. We need to shift the onus of proof and health has to be taken into account. These are the kinds of things that are driving unhealthy diets in our kids, in our adolescents, and what do adolescents eat most of? Burgers, chips and soft drinks. And who's going to dish it out to them in Guildford? The local corner shop will go down the tube and these, these places will survive. Current challenges. I mean, we've gone to a whole new level with junk food marketing of sport. The new AFL-X campaign, people were talking about the advertising because there were the goals, um, you know, so we've gone from the Zupa Dupa KFC cricket to the AFL-X and now we're going to go into the AFL and there, I mean, Faye has done some fantastic work about the amount of junk food sponsorship. It's wallpaper. It's just... We don't even notice it. We kind of notice that because it's blue and it looks a bit different. It's not red and yellow like the Macca stuff. But this is just, and we kind of get used to it, but our kids pick it up and they just, it's just, it creates demand. I saw a little girl in the supermarket saying to her dad, giant super duper stand, I want one of those. It's just water and sugar. That's all it is. So this kind of stuff is, and the highest rating kids programs are sport. So this is what our kids are seeing all the time. Um, and then they're getting it through, through TV as well. So I'm just going to play this little vignette. Yep, Scott is going to help me. Wednesday, book report two. Win a movie ticket? Cool! Oh no, bus is late again. Slurp is for only one dollar. I could get ten. Yes. Best player, wait till I show Jake my Macca's voucher. I wish I had a phone. I could get that Hungry Jack's up too. 
Jake won a thick Jake. Milo sponsors my cricket team, so I think it's pretty good to buy their stuff. Half price. Come on, they're half price. I wish I could be a ninja warrior. I love KFC. Millions. Can't wait to go to Macca's again. But, and a lot of this marketing isn't directed to us. We don't, we don't see this. I just learned about, learned about it through my children. And um, it really tipped me into obesity prevention because I could see that they were being marketed to as kids as the tobacco industry marketed to adolescents. And it's pretty unfair. So what's the problem with, um, with advertising and marketing and self-regulation? Well, if you're setting your own rules and marking your own homework, you're going to get 10 out of 10. And that's what the um, Food and Grocery Council says their scheme does. They're doing very, very well. But it doesn't reduce exposure. There's no evidence anywhere in the world that self-regulation works and it, it should be reducing exposure. The highest rating children's programs aren't covered. Coca-Cola are launching their Raspberry Coke in the highest rating children's programs to target teens. So our young kids are just collateral damage with that and they're not being held accountable. It doesn't address new marketing platforms, particularly um, Facebook, um, and uh, Snapchat, uh, those platforms, no sanctions of breaches because you don't, you know, you don't smack yourself. Um, and they determine their own nutrition criteria. So I showed a box of Cocoa Pops before, 33% sugar, they meet the criteria to be marketed to children. And yet the industry say they meet government guidelines and nutrition standards. Well, that is not true. Um, and there's a very narrow interpretation. So if there's an advertisement um, that is very childlike, and some of these ads are very childlike with animations, if they say um, it's to create nostalgia in adults for their childhood, like they did about one ad set in a school, then it's said not to be primarily directed to children. So the bar is very, very low. Um, some other um, good things that are being done are the Health Star rating system. We did quite a lot of advocacy to get Kellogg's to adopt it. Um, it's the only voluntary scheme where they have taken on the front of pack labelling, but as I said, it's appearing on healthier foods and not the less healthy foods. And there's a number of problems, although number three, uh, my, uh, Nestle have just taken the Health Star rating off Milo altogether. It should get 1.5 stars. You buy it in that tin, uh, but they've taken the, a, cup, uh, a cup of skim milk um, and added that into the, into the system to get four and a half stars. And that's problematic. And some products which are high in salt or fat or sugar can get a high star rating. We don't think that should happen. Stars should be on all products, particularly those marketed to children. Added sugar is not ad adequately dealt with in the calculation. And having five health stars on, um, on fruit juice um, is not appropriate either. Right, let's, let's be happy now. <laughs> Doom and gloom. Um, but we have seen some really um, good moves uh, around whole of government approaches. And these have been done in the ACT and New South Wales. New South Wales has a 25 year strategy, clearly bipartisan, working towards um, change over, over time. And their, and their aim is to see um, slow and reduce childhood obesity. ACT are the same, both led by the Chief Minister and the Premier. Um, I went to a meeting the other day in New South Wales and there were some from the Department of Premier and Cabinet. So this engagement and involvement from senior levels of government and across Cabinet um, is, is good and there's a lot of very good things happening um, as a result of these long-term commitments. Um, changing the food supply, there's a lot of activity. The community is really behind this. So even when we're not seeing um, broad-based statewide approaches, we're seeing places like the YMCA get rid of sugary drinks in all outlets that they control. Fantastic move. We're seeing um, the Western District Health Service saying we're getting rid of sugary drinks. We're seeing Geelong City Council have a fo whole focus on reducing availability of sugary drinks. The pool um, in Geelong, the Lara Pool, took, got rid of all their red foods and they're mostly green foods. Okay, they lost their coke awning 
Now they've got something else there. Um, no decline in spend per person. With the YMCA, again, no decline in spend per person. Um, so there's a lot of activity happening at the community level, getting rid of the snakes, bringing back the oranges, Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre, don't have any red foods anymore. Um, they broke their contracts with the um, suppliers of their vending machines. <laughs> um, the head of the uh, organisation just said, rang them up and said, I want to break them, and they said, you can't. So he said, I've put them all in the loading dock uh, and you can come get them in a couple of years, but you can get them tomorrow if you want. And they came and picked them up. But this kind of leadership is really important. He got rid of all the Fredo Frog branding around the kiddies' swimming pool. It was awesome. It was really good. And um, New South Wales, at the end of last year, no sugary drinks in New South Wales health services. Gone. The announcement was made in July. They were gone by December and the food supply in health services has to improve. This hospitals should be promoting only the healthy choice. If you want a Coca-Cola, get it brought in. If you want a good coffee, you have to get that brought in, for goodness sake. <laughs> so let's be real here. Um, hospitals should be mirroring and promoting healthy food choices, not Oh, I went to Liverpool Hospital, I don't even want to talk about it, Western Sydney, the highest rate of overweight and obesity in Australia. Terrible. So why is progress so slow? Um, I'm not going to put all the blame on me, <laughs> but sometimes I think, oh, why is it so slow? What do I, can I do better? But I think uh, we've seen this week that the food industry is loud and proud and very influential with economic power comes political power. And somehow they've got a seat at the table and I think that started with the Preventative Health Task Force. Um, um, and when, oh God, I can't remember her name now. But anyway, the woman who then headed up the Food and Grocery Council stayed on that Preventative Health Task Force, Kate Carnell. And we shouldn't have industry in the room making policy. We should have them in the room when we're talking about implementation. We don't have enough pressure from civil society, but I think that's changing. And I think in Western Australia, you have a very motivated um, community because you've had a campaign telling them how to change. And I think they'd be supportive of government making changes that would help them and their families and create a consistent environment. Um, sometimes parts of government can't implement policies. There's no point in me talking to the Minister about implementing a tax on sugary drinks in Western Australia because they don't have the constitutional ability to do it. So you kind of need to know who can do what. And I mean, I wish Barry hadn't gone because I'm playing into his songbook. Too little empirical assessments of programs and policies. The evaluation often comes too late or it's not done at all. We need a dietary survey. That is really important. Um, oh, and these aren't my views. These are from The Lancet again. <laughs> Um, and Margaret Chan um, put it very well when she said it's not just big tobacco anymore, public health can, must contend with big food, big soda and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics. That's why we're seeing all this self-regulation. It's a problem for everybody. As Barry said, it's not a failure of willpower. We've got more than a million people in this category. There is something seriously wrong with our society. This isn't everybody lying on the couch and throwing up their hands and saying, forget it. This is a deep endemic societal problem that we all need to grab and see what needs to be done in, in the areas that we can influence. And, oh, sorry. Sorry, Beverages Council. You didn't come. Anyway, uh, hi, you're probably watching online. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but you know what? I don't think the head of the Beverages Council is an expert in public health. We don't go to their marketing seminars. We don't, we don't rock into their strategy workshops. Why should they be coming and sitting at the table with what we're doing? I've read their annual report. What are they doing? Working against a tax on sugary drinks being adopted as a policy at a federal level, undermining school canteen guidelines and undermining hospital guidelines. So where do you think they're going to go with this one? Do you think they're going to say that's a good idea, changing the food supply? I don't think so. <laughs> and what they are doing is what the tobacco industry did. They are forming the same groups with the same people and I know a lot of you are involved in tobacco, the Australian Association of Convenience Stores, Australian Association of National Advertisers, same gang, same people, same stuff. 
individual problem. We want to work with you to support individuals to make healthier choices. They'll just sit back and create the problem and then individuals and government will mop it up. Not good enough. And they frame it as a problem for the individual and the parent and then the government is heavy handed and it's a nanny state. Well, you know what, we're all going to be paying for those hospital beds, the bigger ambulances, that kind of thing. And I know I had to put up the beetroot. <laughs> Poor Barnaby, but you know, there was Barnaby saying, you've got to do the elf diet, eat less food. It's too late for that. That horse has bolted, eating less food, we've got to do the tobacco control elements, change price availability and promotion. So what do we need to do more of? Building consensus, this is our tipping the scales report for the federal government, eight urgent actions that have been agreed by 36 public health groups. Public education and mass media are really important. As I said, Live Light is brilliant. And people want a fact tax. Wow, I know. People support a junk food crackdown. The public support this. Don't be misinformed. People want this kind of stuff. They get it. I think they get it because we've been so successful in tobacco control. So finally, I want to say we all have spheres of influence. We all need to build and amplify on what has already been done. There's some very, very good stuff happening here. We want the bottom up. That's really important, but we need the top down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You got us all really charged up, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, there are so many questions that I'm actually going to go directly to the questions that have come from the audience. Yep. Um, and although you have answered this question, I feel like there's such strong supports for it that uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Would the banning of vending machines that sell unhealthy food and drink in WA hospitals be one low cost opportunity for WA Health to lead by example? Yes. Yeah. So, I, so why is it? Why hasn't it happened? I guess. Well, and, and uh, uh, just the experience from uh, Victoria, some of the work that they're doing um, is about trying to support the people that make the products for these vending machines to make healthier products. So, s school canteen food has changed mm. because there are guidelines. So, the industry, if there's demand, the industry responds. So, it, it creates an opportunity for innovation. And I'm sure there are parts of government which support that kind of thing. So if you create the demand, the business will come. And if that's a concern, it's starting to change in, in places where that demand has been created. So in other words, the hospitals need to be asking for it or the hospitals can make that decision on their own? The hospitals can make that decision, but don't worry, there will be businesses that can deliver mm. a healthier product. Okay. Um, the, uh, these are in no particular order because they keep reordering themselves. Um, what skills are missing in the current public health workforce to achieve the policy changes required, such as removing food marketing to kids? Um, I don't think we're putting enough... Um, well, I mean, this is kind of a sad story. My group is 1.3 EFT for probably the biggest public health issue in Australia to do advocacy on behalf of public health groups. That's pretty bad. I don't know there's anyone in this room working full-time in obesity prevention. I mean, great, good, three people. You know, that is a tragedy. That is a real tragedy. We need to put more resources into the advocacy. Look at what we're up against. How many people does Jeff Parker have in his team? A lot, and the AFGC. So we're up against not just the lobby groups, but these big businesses. We need to be talking to um, politicians. We need to be building the evidence base. We need to be investing in this, uh, and we need to be talking to people all the time, but we don't have the resources that we need to do that. How do we target and address excess body weight in disadvantaged populations? And I know we'll be hearing from Wendy Casey on this in the next session, um, but including welfare dependent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people with a disability. That is a really uh, difficult question because I think we need to do these broad based environmental press the broad-based environmental levers that I was talking about, but in sp some communities we need to bring in particular programs. So there's programs like Food Sense, which helps support people to shop, prepare, 
uh, health, shop and prepare shop for and prepare healthy food, for example. But there are wider social determinants that underpin this that are not going to be addressed by programs. They need um, you know, education. Um, a lot of those social determinants of health sit, sit behind that. And there would be improvements not just in health but in, in other areas. Mm. Uh, but there are a lot of things, and I think Wendy's going to talk about some of them for Aboriginal communities in particular, that are likely to be more successful than others. Um, you talked about how urgent it is that we have this national nutrition policy um, and that, that's the question here is what would it take for us to get, get that started? Well, I think um, a lot of work has already been done. Um, it, uh, a policy has been developed, uh, the background for that policy. It has been um, made public through FOI. So a lot of that work's been done. I know there was a meeting with um, uh, Fiona Nash but I think uh, out of that meeting she decided we didn't need a policy. But I think we all need to talk about it. I think we all need to put pressure on our politicians to do more. This is, the system can't cope. And it's what happened in tobacco control. The system couldn't cope. And in the end, the, that reverberated through society and the same thing is happening. So what would you want to see in a nutrition policy? Well, I think we'd want to see the evidence-based recommendations from the World Health Organisation, for example, around ending childhood obesity. And they go to protecting children from unhealthy food marketing, but they also go to the broader areas of healthy food supply, putting a health levy on sugary drinks, um, a range, better labelling, a, a range of things. It's, it's, I know it's complex, but it's kind of simple. Yeah, so it's the same stuff that keeps... You know what to do, again. it's the implementation mm. that's the problem. But it's interesting, because I was reflecting as you were talking about how, you know, where you're setting goals for, for making progress in this area, and about how the narrative around the goal is often kind of negative, but to turn it into a positive... So, so it's a deprivation of all the things we like to eat and drink. Um, but how do you change that narrative into something that's really positive so that it's, it's not about fat shaming as it, as it is about celebrating, you know, people being in their right size, healthy bodies, active and well? Yeah, and it's about understanding food as culture as well, I think. But I think it's also how you talk about it. And um, I was talking to an endocrinologist who treats women um, with, uh, who develop type 2 diabetes, gestational <coughs> diabetes. And she was saying we should talk about being an unhealthy weight because it's the new normal, particularly in some communities, people are mostly obese. Mm. And people can't really judge where they sit. They think they're an okay weight. So she tells them they're an unhealthy weight. And then she, she tries to make it real for them and says things like, if you drink um, a, cup of, you know, a cup of coffee a day, just cut out one cup of coffee. So trying to give them, you know, if you have a biscuit at morning tea or two biscuits, make it one biscuit. So her aim is just to, because that's where the weight gain's coming from, not very much every day. So she's trying to make it real for them, achievable. Even if you don't put on any more weight, that is quite appropriate because Barry didn't say this, but we're all ageing over time and we're getting he heavier at younger ages. And the where, where the growth is, is in obesity. So the more we can keep people from moving into these unhealthy weight categories, the better. And I think making it achievable and being respectful and supporting people in that is really important. So what was your attitude to his suggestion that a three kilo uh, loss would, would be great? Good um, I, don't, I, I, mean, I don't know if Live Light has got any data about how do people lose weight, but it's pretty difficult for people to lose weight and even losing 15% 15% of your body weight is a good thing. So I think we should start by supporting people not to put on weight over time and, you know, tips for not putting on weight over Christmas and Easter. I mean, Easter's already started. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, people... A treat isn't just on one day. Treats are all the time. Mm. So I think we need to... And people put on weight during those holidays. So it's about supporting them to just be a little bit more mindful, but not in a, you have to lose three kilos. It's, it's too much for people. Mm. I don't know if this answered your question, Pip, but Pip's put up a question that says, how, how can we ensure our obesity programs do not veer into the shame and blame territory when people don't succeed? Yeah, and I think that's why um, having a number of different messages, depending how motivated and able people are to make change, is important. So whether it's weight maintenance, whether it's weight loss, um, I think there's different ages and stages. Um, so I think we need to be aware of that and it's not appropriate for a 70 year old person potentially to be losing weight, mm. for example. Um, so people understanding what is a healthy weight but understanding before they get into these unhealthy weight categories because it is hard to lose weight. Yeah. 
How much do you think the, the community around you, as in everyone working towards a, a similar kind of goal, it makes a difference to achieving the goal? I think it makes a really big difference because it keeps things simple. If government wants to act, they need to know that they'll get a lot of support, particularly if political capital is involved and in some of this stuff, there's political capital. So I think they need to know that there is a supportive uh, public health community and, and others. ACOS have come out supporting a 20% health levy on sugary drinks. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, important to know who's behind it, where the support will come from, and also that it's acceptable to the public. And for those groups that do need extra support, if it's a, a, if it's a health levy, for example, then you need to do something in um, disadvantaged communities, so potentially add more subsidies to healthy foods, yeah. put in more programs. So a little bit like when the, um, you put health warnings on cigarettes um, or tax cigarettes, I think there was a subsidy put on um, nicotine replacement therapy. So thinking about how, you know, a uh, uh, carrot and stick kind of approach, um, I think is helpful. Mm. Uh, because it crossed my mind that where you're saying that there is community support for, you know, healthier eating and for getting rid of junk food marketing and all that kind of thing, it's actually a cry for help. You know, so it's, please help us find a solution to this battle that we're having in our daily lives. Absolutely. I mean, everybody, everybody faces it. And, and I don't know, if you're in the supermarket and you just see parents fending their children off, you know, and there's Geoffrey Parker saying, just say no. Well, that's fine. But low-income families do want to treat their children. They can't buy them a, uh, you know, a bike or take them on a holiday. So this is how they treat their kids with these kinds of things. And that's understandable because there's not a lot of other things that, you know, they're quite disempowered. So I think we need to think about, as a parent, it just drove me cr in, I mean, I couldn't stop it. My daughter at two said, oh, she saw something purple. She said, purple is chocolate. It was two. <laughs> And she knew about McDonald's and it was just, you know, her, she won her basketball and they went to McDonald's to celebrate because they got these vouchers. She'd come home with that chocolate fundraiser. It was just, yep. the sport was full of bring the snakes. It's like, I'm not bringing snakes to the sport. But I was that mother. Mm. And she was like, well, don't go into the school. <laughs> don't you dare go to my school. <laughs> oh, God, it was terrible. But I didn't want to be that person. But that, I was forced into a corner by the industry and I was forced and I couldn't protect my kids and I had a lot of resources at my disposal <laughs> so I think a lot of parents face that it's it's difficult mm. another question from the audience is how do we make these policy changes uh, particularly I guess in the, that urgent list that you came up with um, without uh, with avoiding the accusation of nanny state well I mean you're going to get nanny state but I think the thing is do we think it's good not to have seatbelts in cars? Do we think it's good to allow people to smoke in offices? Uh, do you think we should have campaigns to stop people from swimming outside the flags? I mean, all these things are designed to um, support people to be healthier. And nannies look after children. That's what I would say. You've been asked that question before. No, I just think, why is nanny such a pejorative term? Mm. You know? <laughs> but it's, that's what government does. That is their role. Mm. They do that. And it helps to iron out inequality because it applies to everybody. Mm. And that's really important. I'm sure you know, low-income families spend more time watching TV than high-income families. And they're seeing more of this marketing. Yeah. Uh, well, along those lines then, the, the question is how does government persuade food industry to stop marketing, promoting and discounting junk food and sugary drinks? Well, they don't persuade because we've been trying to persuade and how's it going? Not very well, I don't think. What do you, anyone think it's going well? <laughs> Unmitigated disaster. So I don't think you negotiate. I've, I mean, I've done it. I've tried to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that because I haven't got experience in it. I have. I know. I, I've done it, it didn't work. I've done it a few times and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you need to regulate, you need to have a stick. Now we're, I think we're probably gonna see industry come out with more self-regulation around marketing because it's gonna become a hot, hotter topic in the lead up to the federal election. Mm -hmm. We don't need more self-regulation. We need, we need regulation, we need to create a level playing field. There are some businesses out there that don't market to children. You know, there are businesses that are doing a good job, so we should, and we should support the promotion of healthy food. There are plenty of companies out there making healthy food that could be marketed mm. to kids. Bring it on. Yeah. 
Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that you've got a, a lengthy background in tobacco control as well, and I, I know that you, you're obviously a great admirer of the Live Lighter campaign, which has some parallels to, to anti-smoking campaigns. How many parallels do you think there are in terms of the way we can approach dealing with obesity and the way we approach dealing with tobacco? I think there are a lot of parallels. It's about pricing, promotion and availability. It's about demand and supply, and we need to look at both sides of that. Um, some of these industries are the same industries. They've just hived off their tobacco bits because of, the, um, because of concerns around litigation. You know, Coca-Cola Amatil, <laughs> that was a tobacco company. Um, Rothmans and, and Kraft, Jacob Souchard, Philip Morris. I mean, they were all the same people. So I think we need to take the same approach. We need to do education. We need to regulate around supply and price. Um, and we will get change, but unless we do that, we're going to get millions more people in an unhealthy weight category. And what will happen is we will not have a healthy, productive workforce. And I think speaking to that economic cost is really critical. And COAG did that, and that's why they put the funds into the Preventative Health Agreement, mm -hmm. which has been now pulled, which the Food and Grocery Council are very supportive of. Surprise, surprise. But that was really important. That was funding some important preventive action in, in the states. And that it's just the foot is off the pedal. And I think it is hard to argue for prevention. It's because, as Simon Chapman says, no one's going to knock on my door and say, thank you for not stopping me from starting to smoke. And you're not going to get the benefit in your political term. So you have to really commit to something which, you know, in the typical kind of political world is going to be difficult and a relative hard sell with the commercial interests mm. that are involved. But unless these vested commercial interests are taken on, we will continue not to get progress. We are not meeting our benchmarks. Mm. No one's shining a light on that. So uh, I think we need to work harder to show the problems. So what was the, the clincher then in terms of the tobacco campaign that I guess galvanised that political will to the point where something actually got done. And have we got there with the, with the evidence that we have with obesity, or are we still looking for the, you know, the, the golden ticket? We don't need any more evidence. And as more evidence comes out, it's sort of like, yeah, we know that. Yeah. You know, I think there's this sort of complacency that, yeah, everyone's, you know, huge obesity problem. Uh, so I think that's a problem. There's not a sense of urgency, as I said. I think about this quite a lot. I'm not sure what happened in tobacco. I think we were very coalesced, the public health groups, around what we wanted. Um, and so we were all pushing in the same direction for quite a long time. And there wasn't any one thing. It did happen slowly. I mean, Mike Daub said overnight success doesn't happen overnight. But um, it was, in the end, I think it was the economic cost to government that really helped. When, once Treasury understood what this was doing, uh, to the system, the health system, but I think we're starting to see that. We've just started to get um, the colleges advocating around this issue, but up until now, they've just been replacing people's knees and trying to get more lap banding. But now they're on board, and Nick Talley said to all the presidents of the colleges, you should make the health services healthier, get rid of these junk foods and drinks. So um, we're starting to, I think it's really important we have the medical profession on board talking about having eight nurses to move a patient every few hours. Um, the lifting machines they have to have, the, you know, in, this is terrible and the, um, the political correspondent of the Herald Sun always wants me to talk about this, but we have people going to the zoo to be scanned mm. because they can't fit into the... Yeah. health system. But this is, you know, and I know the new uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital was the corridors are wide, the toilets have all been built, the chairs or the beds, everything's been built to carry these very heavy patients because that's the new reality. So we put it into infrastructure, but we also need to make a, a change to try and stop more and more of these people, um, you know, entering our health system. So then to does there need to be a political champion in this, somebody or a group of people who are currently 
I don't know, maybe they are in existence, maybe you know their names, or maybe there isn't anybody who is currently in power who has that will and is prepared to galvanise the right people to drive that th the thing, to, the, to really seismic decisions that actually make a difference. Yeah, and I think Baird, to some extent, and now Berejiklian coming in in New South Wales, I think, I think they are, I think the Chief Minister of the ACT, I think they are um, champions. I think they are the people we should be looking to, to see how did they do it, what did they do, what, what's the model. But that leadership is really important. And you're right, we need a champion like Nicola Roxon around plain packaging. You do need a champion because you're going to be harassed and your office is going to be wrung and the same as the alcohol industry, we'll hear about that this afternoon, you will be put under pressure not to take these effective actions. And so far the industry has won in stopping that. But we need someone to stand up and say, I'm doing this for kids, I'm doing this for families. You know, I always think of Western Australia as such a healthy place. You've just got such a fantastic physical environment. Wouldn't it be greater if, uh, wouldn't it be good if it, we had a, a, a healthier environment? Um, you know, you could really make a stand out and um, you don't have a food industry based here. So you have a big advantage um, in that respect. Just need a champion. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Um, going back to the questions from the audience, uh, should the amount of sugar uh, be mandatory, rep uh, mandatory reported on alcoholic drinks? Um, well, I've just discovered this. I met Robert Lustig, who's um, a sugar campaigner. I also met Sarah Wilson with him at the same time, and they were going off to have a glass of wine. And I was like, oh, what about the sugar? And they said there's no sugar in wine. So if you put a nutrition... I know! Awesome! So if you put a nutrition information panel on a wine bottle, it would just have energy. So I think we should have energy on alcohol containers, mm -hmm. but not a nutrition information panel, because then it wouldn't have any sugar in it, and it would probably look good, and people would think that was a good thing. But there's a lot of energy in alcohol. Um, uh, going back to regional and remote communities, this question says Aboriginal people and people living in remote areas don't have sufficient access to nutritious foods. I think this stat was that it cost them 30% extra for the same uh, kinds of foods. Um, should this be included in policy actions against obesity? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. And I think that needs to be an absolute priority. That it's a human right, food and water, and you cannot get healthy foods. And I think um, Wendy's going to talk about some things that can be done. But, and having gone into some of those communities, I was, I was really shocked. You can always get white bread and Coca-Cola. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be happening. And I know Mandy Lee talking about the APY lands and trying to get a fridge put in. And she didn't get a fridge. They put in a deep fryer in the store. And then they had to build a, you know, 10 years later, they're building a dialysis unit, oh. you know, for the sake of a fridge. This is... These choices are being made all the time, but they have really deep, long-lasting repercussions. And for Aboriginal communities, people being taken away from their homelands to have dialysis, is, it's really tragic. It's, but I think a really strong focus needs to be put on those communities. What are the pros and cons of having supermarkets at the government obesity policy development table? Um, I don't think supermarkets should be at the policy development table um, unless they show commitment. So um, Gary Sachs, who did the Food Policy Index, has done um, looked at um, the policies of supermarkets and they don't even get to 50%. They hit 46% as far as um, best practice. And that's just on policies, not what they actually do. So I think um, if you look at what supermarkets biggest sellers are, it's Coca-Cola, white bread, PAL and cigarettes. So that's their business. So I think we need to be cognizant of they get people into the store with their fresh food. But I think there's a lot more work that can be done and I know they've explored it, but I don't think they've done it. Um, I want to go back to the, the data question, which is kind of still on my mind, about how, what evidence do we have that change in food policy actually helps people at a grassroots level to lose weight? Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a good question. It's just the time frame is so long for, that, for those um, proximal changes to then play out. So it's, it does take decades to see. It's not like someone just quits smoking and then well, they I quit. saw that picture of visceral fat in the Live Lighter campaign. It changed my life. 
Yeah. And my, one of my team saw that sugar film and said, oh, I didn't realise there was so much added sugar. And, and she lost quite a lot of weight because she and her family were eating a lot of added sugar that she wasn't aware of. I mean, educated woman, and, and she didn't know. And I think telling people that information is, is interesting because people think that it doesn't make a difference, but that's why the Live Lighter campaigns succeeded because it's made people think, stop and think. And that's really important, and across all socioeconomic levels as well. So that's really critical too. You're not just talking to the worried well. Um, and now I've forgotten your question. <laughs> uh, it was about wh whether changes in food policy actually oh, yes. gets people to lose weight. Um, well, that's another funny thing. I, should you look at whether they don't put on weight at the same rate? Mm. Because we're all putting on weight, basically. So um, what, what are you measuring? You just want to know, is the trend changing at all? Is it slowing down? Um, that's really what you want to know. The impact is, yeah, if, if it slows. But maybe you want to look at diet first. That's why I think we need a dietary survey. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, the diet will change and then it will have an impact on weight. Yeah. And then over longer time, people won't ever become as fat as they were becoming. Yeah. Yeah. That's my dream. <laughs> I have a dream. I hope dream. I'm still alive. <laughs> um, how can we make a whole of government approach to action on obesity and necessity at the ballot box? Is social media the answer? Yeah, and this is, um, you know, I think people like Jamie Oliver, uh, people like Sarah Wilson, whether you like her or not, people like that have a huge social media following. Jamie Oliver got the levy on sugary drinks in, in the UK. The politics was right, so that environment was right, but he got that over the line and he spoke to the public. And, and we need those same champions, um, community champions, as well as political champions. But that tipped it. So people like that and creating a community for change is really important. And you don't have to get government policy. You can get your local recreation centre to change their policy. Things like that. You can get, you know, I used to hate it, my, um, that sports centre. You could have parties there and they'd served up the crappiest food to your kids, soft drinks and sausage rolls and chips. It was like... I didn't want to bring my own food. I'm not, I just wanted them to have a fun time, but I wanted them to have healthy food. Yeah. <laughs> there was no fruit platter, there was, there was nothing. So we all have a voice, we all have a sphere of influence. We can all change those little things uh, as we go through life. And then the bigger stuff, over to the government. Mm. Do the champions need to walk the talk? Oh, I struggle with this. I was gonna go through menopause and lie on the couch and join the millions of others. <laughs> And um, then I met Rosemary Stanton. I don't know if you yeah. met Rosemary Stanton, but oh, she's awesome. And I thought, oh dear, my new role model. And so I just got on my bike. But it is very hard. I mean, when Nick Cormus talks about people who are above a healthy weight trying to, um, trying to eat well, I, I get it. It's hard. It's really hard. And I remember reading a, a piece about Susan Lee, and they followed her around her electorate. First of all, she doesn't eat sugar. Her father had diabetes, I think type 2 diabetes. And um, for lunch, she had a dim sim because it's all she could get. Mm -hmm. That's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a tragedy in a country town that all there was available on the weekend was a dim sim. And that's a lot of people's lives are like that. And a lot of people have never eaten healthily. 97% of people don't eat a healthy diet. So we've got a long way to go. but. Yeah, walking the walk. I mean, I didn't walk around too much because I was scared I would it either. The other day I fell off the back of one of these. I mean, that was a whole new thing, <laughs> really. <laughs> it's fine to fall off the front. But so, anyway, but being active is important. So I just, I just ride my bike, I get on it. It doesn't matter if it's, I've done it in hail. It's very unpleasant, but I do that basically every day. That's my thing. I'm really grateful to the person who submitted this question because I wanted, I'd forgotten to ask you this. Why did you say we should target adolescents more than younger children in terms of turning things around? Well, um, I, I always think that's an interesting question. Who should you target? Where are the greatest gains? And it was Barry's daughter and now he's gone. So, um, but I saw one of his staff present that at an um, uh, Australian New Zealand Obesity Society meeting and because I always thought we should be intervening with children. With adolescents, um, boys first go through this huge weight gain when they leave school, and then women um, a little bit later. But, you know, how do we... we it's, it's massive. It's a huge... It's a huge increase. A bit like that's where the smoking prevalence went up in, in, in um, boys when they left school. 
So these adolescents are a really important group and they are totally ignored. But if you play it out through the system over time, that's where we should be intervening. And we have totally got our hands off the wheel with them. So how, how would we talk to them? Well, we're just doing a campaign actually with Rethink Sugary Drink um, that's targeting adolescent boys. And you have to kind of go out of your comfort zone. <laughs> It doesn't appeal to me at all. So it's probably perfect. <laughs> but um, I think you need to be, it's, it's difficult. I, I think it can be a bit hit and miss, but we certainly should be ensuring that high schools are promoting healthy food uh, and that we don't forget about adolescents um, when we're trying to support them to go out into the world and be um, empowered to um, eat healthily. So we're looking at maybe reskinning this Food Sense program to make it attractive to um, to um, young boys when they're leaving school and starting to cook themselves about, you know, because a lot of them don't have the resources to be able to cook and buy and prepare food. So if you can help them um, do that, I think that would be one way of empowering them. But all this marketing that they're getting, it's working. There's no need to cook. That's what the marketing says. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to journalists the other day, a young guy, and he goes, oh, I've just got a Domino's two for one on my phone. I was like, see, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, just this one final question. Shouldn't we spend a greater proportion of the government budget on prevention? Yes. It's cheap and worthwhile. Yes. We are very, very low in the proportion of funding that we spend on prevention. And I think it's very brave of the West Australian government to spend so much on the Live Lighter campaign, but it's very much worth it. And I think you could really leverage off that um, with more. But I think regulation is quite cheap. Mm. Jane, thank you so much. It's been a very energising conversation. Please thank Jane Martin. Thank you.